So my first question then, Bruce, is from Richard Harrison. He said this, he felt that no place like home was a step too far in the wrong direction after peace in our time. But the Buffalo Skinners is a hard and heavy record, probably the best sounding big country album that captures the power of the band's legendary live performances. So take us back to those uh, two albums before this one then that we're going to talk about. What was happening with the band on those previous albums and why do you think that they didn't land as well as they should have? No Place Like Home, um, which was album number five. Um, Mark was in the band at the time, um, our original drummer. <coughs> um, although Mark actually played on the album, he came back and did it as a session. And it was kind of a little bit dis disjointed um, because Mark wasn't in the band. The songs were kind of written in various demo situations and they were never really rehearsed as a band anyway. Um, the album, it's, it's not a bad album, but it sounds like it was recorded with, you know, by four or five different bands, you know. It was just a little bit disjointed. Um, so that's probably the reason that um, the chaps, you know, a big fan of the album, you know. But uh, when we did Buffalo Skinners, Mark was still not in the band. In fact, Mark, mm -hmm. Mark, Mark never played on the Buffalo Skinners album, but we that album was demoed with, Tony Stewart and myself um, actually sitting in a studio playing them together. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and we've got Simon Phillips and he played drums on it, um, which he, he did in two days and did a fantastic job. And then after that, uh, Mark, Mark came back to the band anyway. But I think that's the reason, you know, no place like home, it's quite a disjointed. There was no cohesion, there was no continuity just because the way it was the way it was written basically you know and we, we didn't have mark in the band so it was a bit pity <laughs> so in terms of the, the 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 time after that record i mean um did the band split up at this point because the, the label had, had released you as well hadn't they so what was it that pulled you back together what what made you decide to, to go again and, and give it another go the band was always well for the first three albums we were kind of uh, a close-knit unit um and at one point I think it was after album number four, which was Peace in Our Time, um, Stuart left the band and Mark decided to take on extra work. And then two weeks later, Stuart went, oh, I made a stupid mistake. I'm coming back to the band. And, Ma and Mark had kind of booked himself out to work with people like uh, Midge and Fish and stuff like that. So, And obviously he, he couldn't let those people down. So, you know, we were in a bit of disarray for a little while. We were kind of drummerless you know, for, for, for a bit. Um, so, I mean, that that's that's the reason, I think, you know, I mean, Mark was a, such a big part mm -hmm. of how we worked in the studio and he was sorely missed, especially by me. Indeed, indeed. Quick question that, that leads us on to something that John Clark said. He actually says, Simon Phillips' drumming on the record is outstanding. What did he bring to the studio that was different to Mark? A red drum kit. <laughs> and say, he was setting the kit up. He, we did it at Rack Studios. Um, we, we produced it ourselves along with, with Chris Shelton. And I remember Simon bringing his kit in. Uh, I think it was, I don't know, I can't remember if it was Yama, Tama, but it was beautiful red, red, bright fire engine red kit. And I went, that's a beautiful, beautiful kit, Simon. He went, yeah, I got it to match my Ferrari. I went, yeah. <laughs> right on, man, you know. <laughs> he, 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 he did the whole album. I sent him the demos, and basically the demos was drum machine that you know Stuart and I would program and a little drum machine um, and so that's all we had for, for him to reference and he came along and did the whole, whole album in two days and it's like wow you know and then when Mark heard that he went that's exactly what I would have played anyway so you know give me my job back <laughs> <laughs> fantastic <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned there about re um, producing the record yourself. Again, this is something from uh, Michael Saunders. He said, The Buffalo Skinners is such a brilliant album, gritty, so well produced. It's my go to album when I yearn to hear Stuart's voice and guitar. Um, you guys, as you said, you, you produced the record yourselves. How was that as an experience for you then? Was it liberating getting to put your own ideas and things in? Yeah, well, what happened is we, we got signed up um, to a label called Compulsion, which was run by Chris Briggs, who signed us originally to Phonogram. Um, and when Chris came on board, you know, I would keep him up to date with the, the demo situation and send him at that time. It was cassettes and dats, you know, and he kind of liked the way things were going. 
and we, we discussed it and he said, well, maybe you, you've worked with Chris Sheldon before. We, we did a single with Chris Sheldon and yeah. um, <coughs> and Tim, 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 it'll come to me anyway. <laughs> and Tim was away working with Tears for Fears at the time uh, and Chris was still available and I thought, well, you know, Chris was the engineer, but he was, you know, he was a great ideas guy as well. So Briggsy said, you know, like, maybe Chris, Chris and yourself, co-produce it, you know, let's go in the studio, see what happens. And, you know, Chris Briggs would pop his head in a bell of day and say, no, this is sounding really great. This is, you know, just continue, you know. So it, it was it was great, you know, kind of co-producing it ourselves. And we knew Rack inside out anyway, because we'd yeah. done a lot of recording at Rack Studios and we, we knew Mickey, Mickey most and we, we felt comfortable there and, you know, when we, when we first started doing the crossing and the first recordings, obviously we needed help. We needed yeah. a producer or a referee or whatever. But by that point, you know, we were about six albums down the line and we kind of knew what we wanted to do, you know. So Chris Briggs put a lot of trust trust in us. Fantastic. Uh, next question's from Gordon Skinner. He says, it's the noisiest album by the greatest rock band I've ever seen. A slightly different direction by Big Country. From start to finish, it doesn't stop. Now, was that predetermined that you'd went into the studio with the idea of making a big, hard, heavy, strong record? Yeah, well, we knew it was going to be just the way the demos and the writing were going. Um, like I say, Tony, Stuart, myself were in the studio uh, a little place called Audio Craft in Dunfermline. And just really, you know, hand, the three of us were hands on, you know, um, writing together. Um, so we, we kind of knew which way we were going. And for some reason, uh, the songs were just getting heavier and heavier. <laughs> and I, I don't know if that's because, you know, that was just after the whole grunge thing had happened, you know. And, you know, it's just, just, just the way we were at the time, you know, we, we were getting back into loud guitars again. Uh, and we were just rocking out, and you know, a lot of it was four four. You know, it's, it, just the way it was, just the way we were writing back then. It was, it was great. Fantastic. Uh, Richard Metcalf then he says the big man really let his guitar hero out on this one. Love this album, but alone has a sad degree of poignancy given what happened later. Now, do you feel that way about the song as well, Bruce? Well, Stuart always had a knack. The band would always do the music. And sometimes the music that we would do was very uplifting. And Stuart had this knack of putting really sort of dark lyrics to something that was really uplifting, you know? It was just a a weird thing that he, he would do. Um, he's, he's done it quite a lot. So we kind of expected a lot of that kind of lyrics on, on the album. Mm -hmm. But it was just a thing Stuart did, you know? Sometimes his lyrics were, you know, a bit obtuse, sort of fantasy. Some of them were black and white about, you know, things that were happening in the news at the time. Some of them were ideas from books, and then there'd be other things that, you know, whatever was in his head at the time, you know. Fantastic. Uh, here's one from Joe Kay, who's in Milwaukee. He says he's awful at interpreting lyrics. Uh, Selling America is such a brilliant track, but what is it about? What was Stuart trying to say on this one? I haven't got a clue. <laughs> I think I think he'd maybe been watching. There was a movie. Um, oh, it was a Sean Connery movie at the time. Um, I can't remember what it was called now, but the, the, it, it was quite influenced by movies and and books. Was it called Rising Sun or something like that? Sean Connery. I think it was called Rising Sun. Um, I think it, it took a lot of inspiration for that for that um, movie. There you go. There you I, go. I can't tell you exactly word for word, sense for sense, what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a great song. We'll leave it at that. Um, here's one that a lot of people have been in touch about. Stevie T, Nathan Fenton, Justin Keeney and Marv from the podcast and Pods Like Us. They all want to know why the superb title track wasn't included on the final album. Because at that time, vinyl was still on the go. Um, so you had to, you had so many minutes you could do on each side of the vinyl. Um, and that's the reason that Buffalo Skinners wasn't on it because it wasn't, even, even though it was the, the title track, it wasn't in keeping with the rest of the, the music. It's, mm -hmm. Buffalo Skinners is a very 
slow acoustic sort of song and we just felt that it, it, it would fit on the vinyl. But I mean, obviously it was on the CD and everything else that came out. But when you, when you do a vinyl record, you, you're limited to, to time, obviously. Otherwise, the, the, the quality suffers. And what is but it about we tend, that? We tended to do that with a few albums. The, the first album uh, was The Crossing, and we had a song called The Crossing, but we never put that on the album either, you know? So it was just oh. one, one of those things that we, we tended to do. Oh, interesting. So what is it about the, the title of that track then that, that lent itself to the album in, in itself, in its entirety? Oh, we just... We, that, well, we just thought about different album titles and we, we looked at the titles of some of the songs um, that we'd recorded uh, and like I say, Alone, we didn't want to call the album Alone. Mm -hmm. um, so we just kind of felt the Buffalo Skinners was a, a good title to, to go with for the album. Just the one that kind of stuck out, you know. Definitely, definitely does. Uh, Ned Itchum, he says his favourite track on the record is Seven Waves. That one was written by Bruce, I think. What's the story behind it? How did you come up with that one? The music for Seven Waves, at the time, I was living um, on the coast. I was living practically next door to Manny Charlton from Nazareth. Okay. Uh, so Manny was helping me set up my studio at, at home. And he had a, obviously had a home studio as well. So I would go around to, to his place. And, you know, so I we went around to Manny's one day and he was working on my, my computer and uh, he basically he blew it up. <laughs> <laughs> so while uh, I was waiting for spare parts to come for this little computer that I had, he said, well, you know, just come in my studio and I had ideas for some musical ideas I needed to get down fast, you know. So Manny says, right, come in here and start, you know, we'll start recording you. So Seven Waves was me and Manny kind of just working together. Um, he engineered it and sort of co-produced the idea that I had and played a bit of slide on it. And we, we came up with a, well, actually it was my music, but Manny kind of got the best out of me. Um, so I ended up just recording this track, which didn't have a, a title. I, had, I, had, I managed to sing a couple of melodies on the top of it that didn't mean anything, but they were just there for, they were just placeholders. And then I just yeah, did the usual, just took up the Stuart and went, yeah, that's great. And, he took it away and put his lyrics there, you know, and so that's how Seven Waves came about. Great stuff. Uh, here's one from Paul Lewis and Mark Hay. They're both asking about The One I Love. They said it was released as a single in America, got a lot of airplay, charted quite high on the rock charts as well. But they both want to know why it wasn't released as a single in the UK or Europe. Um, well, we were with a compulsion in the UK um, and we were with Fox Records in America, um, as in 20th century Fox style of a label. So, I mean, it happens a lot. Uh, if you're on one label in the UK, it doesn't mean to say you're going to be on the same label in, in America or even Europe. So they tend to just put out what they think is suitable for that territory. Um, and they, they chose the one I love. And you know, I was quite happy for that to, to come out as well, you know. I guess maybe they thought alone might have been too heavy or whatever, but uh, they went with that and it did okay. It did okay there. Yeah. And did the the seeing the success it had over in in North America did that not kind of prompt you to to or the record company to do the same over here? Well, it's the, the label, you know, the label. I think they went with the alone um, and ships. Ships, yeah. yeah. Uh, whereas they just went with the one I love in America. It's, it's basically a step of the label. It's, you know, they, they kind of own it and they can do what they want. And we, we were quite happy if, if one I love got released in the UK or Europe as well. That would have been great as well, but they, it didn't happen that way. That's the way it goes. Um, speaking of America, Carl Kusumano, apologies if I got that wrong, he says the US version of the record had the bass increased, which he says made the entire album sound so much better. Um, he says listening to the US and the UK versions is a distinct difference. Why was that, yeah. Bruce? The reason being the, um, the American release got released months later. It wasn't simultaneous. And I think, well, what was it going to uh, George Marino came in to remaster it for America. And the sound, if you play them, if you A, B them, play, they play one of the songs back to back, it's quite evident mm -hmm. that the US version, uh, in my opinion, is far superior. It, it does sound a lot different, a lot. The mix is the same. It's the same master tapes. It's just been, uh, just been mastered differently. And uh, I mean, I've, I've noticed that quite a lot. 
especially way back in the eighties, you know, you get into a, a cab in America and they've got the, the radio on, and I don't know if it's to do with EQ or compression. It just American radio at that time sounded out of this world. It was amazing, you know. <laughs> Fantastic. Maybe it's the difference between I don't know American engineers and British engineers. I don't know. <laughs> well, the American one did a good job on that one then. Um, here's Eddie Dempsey. He says the 1993 gig in Dublin's Olympia was absolutely rocking. I mean, the place was vibrating. Did Big Country ever record a concert in Ireland? Yeah, I mean, there must there must have been some recordings, whether they got released or not. But th th there's probably been a few recordings that were made out there. Um, whether they were released or not, I, I don't know. I'm not sure, but you do a lot of radio stuff out there. Or you do a lot of gigs out there, and you kind of find out later that was recorded by you know whatever radio station. You never get to hear it because you you, you moved out of that country and you, you moved somewhere else. So I I can't on, honestly answer that hundred percent, but I think there I think there would have been. Must be something somewhere. Uh, there's a lot of people talking about the live tour from this era as well, about how explosive it was, how loud it was. I've got Kenny Henderson said there, the live shows at this time were rocking. Long Way Home Live at the Barrowlands is one of his life highlights. Uh, and Stephen Berlin said, um, he says, I saw Big Country 27 times with Stuart and the best tour was the Buffalo Skinners one. Now, did you feel it yourselves? Was the energy really ramped up when you went out on stage during this era, during this time yeah. with these songs? I, I, I tend to agree. I think the Buffalo Skinners, you know, apart from the, obviously the early days, but I think the Buffalo Skinners too. But when Mark came back on board, um, it, it clicked again. And I just think that those are some of the best shows that we were done. Um, at the time we were doing a lot of the Buffalo Skinners album, as well as the, the earlier stuff as well. And they, they just seemed to fit, you know. And just having Mark back was a, an absolute joy. I, I just felt like we were firing on all four cylinders again. The band back in business. Uh, Justin it's Keeney. It's your drummer that makes the band, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Justin Keeney, he says that this was your best album for me and seemed to be a great period for the band. What's your favourite memory of this time? Uh, oh, loads, loads of great memories, you know. Well, obviously, doing the album, even though it was... Simon Phillips and not Mark, but actually doing the album. Um, and we just seemed to, we just seemed to be on the road quite a lot. We, we, were, we toured America as well on that album. And we went really toured America since the early days. So we did, we did a lot of tours in America, Canada, and we were in Europe a hell of a lot. It was just one of those albums that we, we just got given a great opportunity to, to, to tour the world practically, you know. Fantastic. I think the touring side of things was great. Yeah, always is, always is. Uh, Andrea Thigpen, she just wanted to say, tell Bruce he rocks, loved them from the beginning, was a dream come true to meet him and Mark. Love from Canada, which is a really nice thing to say from Andrea. But you have uh, roots in Canada as well, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was born in uh, Timmins, Ontario, way back in uh, 1961. <laughs> we were born in the same town that uh, Shania Twain was born, but obviously, you know, probably twenty years apart. <laughs> <laughs> so, what brought you back to to Dunfermline then? Uh, the Queen Mary. Oh. <laughs> nice, <laughs> fair enough. Um, and a couple of my parents emigrated, obviously, but um, my, my my father was a, a gold miner out there, eh? and um, I, I just don't think my my mother. Took to, took to it, you know, so they stuck it for a couple of years, then came home on the Queen Mary, so and I ended up back back in Dunfermline. So I'm, I'm the only, only Canadian in a family of Sc Scottish people. There you go. There you go. Uh, and a couple of off-topic questions that came in too. Uh, Mike Lamens, he said, The Sea of the title track, how did Kate Bush come to sing on it? And did, did you get to work with her in the studio at all? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we, we kind of discussed it with Robin Miller, who was the, the producer at the time. And it, we'd been listening to a lot of Kate Bush stuff. And I think that it was the Dreaming we were listening to quite a lot. And mm -hmm. The Seer was kind of had that same sort of vibe as one of the songs in the Dreaming. And, and we were all saying, you know, we probably Kate Bush could <laughs> get Kate Bush on this. It's, you know, it's a laugh over the, over the dinner table. And Robin, you know, oh, I don't know. 
Kate Bush, or I know people that work, you know, or people or whatever. And if you don't ask, you don't get. So Robin sent off a, a cassette to Kate Bush, and she agreed to do it. And she turned up at the studio um, at the power plant in Wilsden. And she was in the studio for five hours. Wow. And we could not believe what she was doing. She completely rearranged all these vocal parts. And we were just blown away, just watching her doing it. We were in the control room upstairs looking down, and uh, she was in the studio. And it was just absolutely amazing, you know. And I, I kind of felt a shame when the album came out because Robin Miller did a, a great mix of the record. And the, the the song The Seer was almost like a duet with, with Stuart and Kate, the way it was done, but the album got remixed later on. And I think they kind of dumbed their vocals down a bit. And I knew that The Seer was almost going to be a single, but it was like seven minutes long or something. And the, the label tried to edit it down. And the edits just wouldn't work. And then obviously it got remixed. So, but, you know, I think a lot more could have been made of Kate's vocal during the, the new mix. But, you know, it's, sometimes these things are out of your hands. But uh, it was just amazing, you know, watching watching and listening to her working. Absolute genius. 100% agree. And uh, what last one from Michael McCauley. He says, Steel Town is my favourite big country album. How come I can't find any demos of the tracks released at all, not even crappy, hissy cassette versions? Because there was only crappy, hissy cassette versions ever demoed. Uh, because The Crossing was quite successful and all those songs were written years in advance. Once we'd done The Crossing, once we'd done all the touring, it's the record company said, well, now basically time to do your second album. And it's like, oh, God, we haven't written anything. So the four of us ended up using a, a rehearsal room up in Edinburgh, uh, and we never demoed anything for that album. But all we had was a, a cassette, a little boombox kind of thing, and we stuck that in, fa- in front of Mark's bass drum, and we used that to get the ideas down. And we never went into a studio to demo, demo any of the songs. We ended up just taking all the ideas across the um, Sweden, across the Polar, which was Abba's studio, and we just um, worked on them in the studio. So we never demoed anything for Steel Time. Ah, well, there you go. So thank you very much for, for chatting about these albums and your music's fantastic. Uh, you're a busy boy as always. I've caught you just before you go back out on tour. There's big touring plans again for this year, March, April, May, early June. It's the 40th anniversary of The Crossing. So tell us about these shows. Well, um, like you say, it's the 40th anniversary of The Crossing. We're going to go out, we, we do the, the album in its entirety, but we, we don't do it in sequential order. Um, and obviously we play a lot of other songs as well, so it, it doesn't make sense to do it in sequential order because it, it just, the, the, the set list would be dynamic if we were to do it like that. Um, so we're going to go out and we've got our special guest is... Um, uh, Kirk Brandon, who's bringing out uh, Spirit of Destiny. Um, so that's going to be great fun because uh, Kirk and I go back a long way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's you know, I think people are going to come out. They're going to see two, two, two good bands. It's going to be a great, great night, great tour. And like I say, you'll get all the, all the songs from The Crossing, uh, plus a lot more. <laughs> 